All right, good morning, everyone. We'll, we'll start session two. Unfortunately, there's no break between the two sessions. Um, session two is improving farm productivity in a lower nitrogen input system. Uh, my name is Siobhan Kavanagh. I'm communications and engagement specialist with the, with the Signpost program. Um, as farmers, you're being asked to reduce your chemical nitrogen input or reduce your reliance on chemical nitrogen. And understandably, there is a worry in doing that. Will I be able to maintain my, my overall grass growth? Will I have grass in the springtime? Will I be able to maintain my quality? Will I be able to maintain my output in terms of milk solids? And that is a concern and that's understandable. So the, the purpose of this morning's session is to really to help to give you the confidence to cut back on chemical nitrogen use by implementing the strategies that are available to us right now in the knowledge that you will hold production if you implement those technologies. And that's really what the purpose of this morning's session is about. But before we, we get into that, um, I think it's useful for us to reflect on why exactly we're looking at renew, reducing nitrogen use in the context of meeting our emissions targets. So we have a target, as was stated earlier on, to reduce emissions by 25% by 2030. So what role does nitrogen have to play on that? And the starting point for looking at that is really looking at where do our emissions come from. Come from. So emissions in agriculture and indeed in all the other sectors in the economy are calculated by, by the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, using the national inventory. So the national inventory is basically an accounting system, and you'll all have heard of it, an accounting system that draws on data from various different sources to generate the emissions within, the diff within different sectors. And I have up here an example of the schematic from the EPA as to how they actually calculate the agricultural emissions. And at the end of the day, we can reduce, we can talk about implementing technologies like clover and making better uses of our clover and everything. But unless it is accounted for here in the national inventory, it doesn't account towards us achieving our targets. And that's really, really significant. So whatever technologies we implement, they have to have an impact here in terms of the, the inventory. Fundamentally, there are two key sources of emissions in Irish agriculture. You have your livestock side, and then you have your fertilizer. So two fundamental, and there's, there's, there's a lot underneath those, but fundamentally, it either comes from the animal or is associated with the animal, or it's your nitrogen fert fertilizer and lime. I'm not going to go through the details of this schema schematic, but if you look at the livestock side of it, you have your animal type, you have grazing versus housed, you have housing type, to housing duration, on the manure management, you have the slurry type, uh, storage length, um, store type, and the same on, in terms of the spread. And so it's quite complicated, and there's a lot of different components in it. So when the EPA are drawn together this national infantry, they draw on data from um, the National Farm Survey, from AIMS in terms of animal numbers, and fertilizer use. So on the other side, you have fertilizer use, so the quantity of fertilizer we use, and the fertilizer type. So it's an awful lot more straightforward the, the, the fertilizer piece of it as opposed to the, to the livestock and what's associated with livestock. At the moment, 16% of the total emissions from agriculture associate, are associated with chemical fertilizer. And the reason why we're asking you to concentrate on reducing chemical nitrogen use is we have right now a, a very strong suite of technologies available to us to help us to do that. On the methane side, it is an awful lot more difficult to shift meat, uh, emissions um, but things like breeding, obviously feed additives that are coming down the line, ages slaughter will all help. But on the fertilizer type, we have the technologies now to help us to, to reduce that. So that's why we're concentrating on that. Even though methane is a, a much bigger component, making up nearly um, two thirds of the, the emissions, because we have the technologies now to focus on nitrogen, that's why there's an emphasis on nitrogen. So there's two key steps within that, so re reducing our reliance on chemical nitrogen. One is reducing our total chemical nitrogen use, and the second one is switching from can and urea to protected urea. So they're the two key technologies within that that will help to reduce our overall emissions. So where do we start? Do we start with, with switching to protected urea or reducing our total chemical nitrogen use? And Lauren Chalou and Jonathan Hearn did a piece of work a short while ago looking at how we, we, uh, how we manage this or what's the best, best approach to it to reduce our reliance on chemical nitrogen. Our target is to reduce emissions by 25%. And in absolute terms, that's five, sorry, that should be 5.75 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents by 2030. They took two scenarios. In scenario one, they reduced 
total chemical nitrogen use across the country by 30% and then switch to protected urea. The impact of that was a reduction in greenhouse gases of 1.25 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent, or about 20% of that 25%. In the second scenario, they switched all of our nitrogen to protected urea or the low nitrate compounds, so switched 100% to protected urea and then reduced our nitrogen by 30%. And the impact was the exact same here. So you ended up with the same end point, 1.25 million tonnes of a reduction in greenhouse gases of our, our to total in the industry. The question is then, which do we do first, or do we get an, an impact from doing one over the other? It was found in that study that by switching from 100% to protected urea first, and then reducing our nitrogen, you got an extra kick in it. So switching to 100% protected urea first, reduced emissions by 0.83 million tonnes, and then the switching to 30% lower nitrogen use in total was a little bit lower. So the advice from this is, firstly, to switch whatever nitrogen you're using to protected urea, and using the low nitrate, nitrate compounds like 18612 and 101020, and then concentrate on, on reducing nitrogen. We know that from case studies and individual farm studies that switching to protected urea, 100% protected urea, can reduce the farm's overall emissions by 78%. It's an easy win, it's a win-win for us. Um, at the moment, protected urea is considerably cheaper, so from a cost point of view, it makes sense. And all the data coming through in terms of production are showing that protected urea is delivering. So the message is reduce, or switch to protected urea first, and then drop, drop chemical nitrogen use. That's a backdrop to where we're at. That's why we're concentrating on nitrogen, because it has the potential to take about 20% off that 25% for us. Um, and we have the technologies to do, to do that. So I'm not going to say any more. That's just a, an introduction. I've kind of a, a dual role here today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Deirdre Hennessy. Deirdre has our first paper this morning. Um, and Deirdre's, Deirdre's, the title of Deirdre's presentation is Nitrogen Strategy and Clover Swords, What Does the Research Say? So, Deirdre, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so just a, a quick introduction, and some of this has already been touched on, but we know Irish milk production systems are underpinned by efficient conversion of grazed grass to milk. And to grow that grass, we have a reliance on nitrogen availability in the system. And we know now we have to reduce chemical fertilizer use. And, and that's going to come through, for example, the farm to fork strategy from the Green Deal is targeting a 20% reduction in chemical fertilizer use. And the food vision is going further to 25 to 30% reduction in, in nitrogen, chemical nitrogen fertilizer use. Okay, so what are the main sources of nitrogen in our system? Look, we always think of the two I've up on the screen there. The bag fertilizer, the chemical fertilizer, and the slurry, okay? But there's other sources of nitrogen as well. We have the urine and the feces that are excreted by the cow into the paddock. While she's grazing, we have atmospheric deposition, which is small, it's about six kilos per hectare. We have mineralization, so that's the nitrogen that's available in our soil. And that's the nitrogen that will grow grass on your farm if you never put out a, a bag of fertilizer are went out with the slurry tanker. So that's the background um, release of nitrogen from the organic matter. And it's, it will grow in somewhere in the region of six to seven tons of grass dry matter per hectare per year. And then we have legumes or clover, which can biologically um, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and make it available for plant growth. So one of these sources, I suppose, is the focus and it's the one that's under pressure, and, that, and that's the chemical uh, fertilizer. So what are the reasons we need to reduce chemical fertilizer use? And look, they've been touched on already, but just to remind you, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, particularly nitrous oxide, but also to reduce ammonia emissions, reduce nitrate leaching. Uh, cost is a, a significant factor now, um, and by reducing nitrogen fertilizer, we can reduce some cost in our systems. We'll also reduce our requirement or our dependence on imports if we're using less chemical fertilizer um, and, you, and reduce our, our fossil fuel use. But you know, what happens if we are in the scenario where we have to reduce uh, chemical fertilizer use? So we're talking about grass-only swards at the moment. So in grass-only systems stocked at two and a half cows per hectare, receiving 250 kilos of nitrogen, those systems are self-sufficient, okay? When we start to drop that nitrogen, 
we're going to end up reducing grass growth if we do nothing else. So that means at, the, at a given stocking rate, we're going to have less self-sufficiency in terms of grass grown to feed the cows and to pr produce silage, and it's going to result in increased purchase of feed onto the farm. And from Elodie Ruel's work, um, she shows that for every 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare reduction in fertilizer use from that 250 kilos, we are going to have to reduce stocking rate by 0.18 livestock units per hectare to remain self-sufficiency. So that's assuming we do nothing else, okay? And in grass-only swards. But if we want to maintain the herbage production in an environment with reduced uh, chemical fertilizer use, you know, there are other things we can do. So, so improving soil fertility being one, making better use of our slurry nitrogen is another. And the one that I'm going to focus on today is incorporating white clover into our systems. So the main impacts of white clover in our dairy production systems are around herbage production, milk production, and biological nitrogen fixation. Okay, so we've mentioned, I've mentioned fixation a few times. So what is this? So this Biological nitrogen fixation is the conversion of atmospheric nitrogen, so the air in the, in the, sorry, the nitrogen in the air that we're all breathing, converting that into a form that the plant can use it to grow. Okay, and this occurs through a symbiotic relationship between the soil rhizobia and the clover. So here, here are some roots of a clover plant, uh, and you see I've, I've three circles on that. They're just to show you the nodules on the clover plant. So if you dug up a clover plant, looked at the roots, you'd see all these little growths on the root, and they're basically the nodules. And what's happening in those nodules is there is bacteria in those. So the bacteria naturally resides in the soil, it has infected the root hairs, it has formed a nodule, so there's a colony basically of bacteria inside in that, nod in that nodule. So then, you know, that's great, we have the, 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 the um, bacteria has infected the clover roots, but yeah, okay, that's fine, what happens next? So the two, the bacteria and the plant, they have a symbiotic relationship, okay? Which means that, um, I suppose, they, they share or they exchange something between each other so they can both exist. So the clover plant supplies the bacteria with uh, energy through photosynthesis, okay? And then that, that bacteria uses that energy to convert the atmospheric nitrogen and make it into a plant usable form and supplies the plant, the clover plant, with nitrogen to grow. Okay, so what influences how much fixation we get in the sward? So clover content is really important. You need good clover content to get fixation. Too much fertilizer nitrogen will reduce the level of fixation in the sward and this is because it takes a lot of energy for the plant to fix nitrogen. So if there's loads of nitrogen available in the soil, more than, say, the grass component of the sward is using to grow, well, then the clover plant will use that nitrogen. So it gets lazy, and it's not um, supporting the bacteria to fix nitrogen anymore. So if you have a lot of nitrogen, chemical nitrogen going out in the, in the sward, you're going to reduce the level of fixation. And then finally, weather conditions do have an impact in terms of the level of fixation. So... Sunshine hours, so remember I said the plant needs to photosynthesize to supply the bacteria with energy, so the more sunshine hours that we get, the better in terms of um, providing energy to the plant, but the, the bacteria also needs uh, warm temperatures and moisture um, to be available to, to, fix that, to fix that nitrogen. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some of, um, I suppose, uh, the key results from the long-term systems experiment that we've run at Moor Park for about the last 10 years. So this is the 2013 to 2020 period. Um, and in that, in that period, we had two treatments, grass only getting 250 kilos of nitrogen, and we had grass clover getting 150 kilos of nitrogen. So a 100 kilo reduction on the clover swords in terms of the nitrogen input. We ran the two systems at the same stocking rate, 2.74 cows per hectare, and we managed everything the same except for the chemical fertilizer that was going on to the two treatments, okay? So we essentially had two farmlets within Moor Park, one getting 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare on a grass-only sward, and the other 150 kilos on a grass clover sward. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the results. So as I said, both systems were stocked at the same stocking rate. In terms of herbage production, we had similar herbage production across the two treatments and similar um, silage uh, conserved across the two treatments. 
Neither treatment at that stocking rate was self-sufficient in terms of silage production. Um, and then in terms of silage fed during the lactation, there was about 70 kilos more fed on the clover treatment compared to the grass-only treatment, and most of that was, was fed in the autumn rather than in the spring. Uh, both treatments got the same quantity of concentrate fed per cow, so an average over that eight years of 438 kilos of concentrate. And the sward clover content on the clover treatment averaged 22% across the, across the eight years. Looking then at the milk production results, so both milk yield and milk solids were increased when we had clover in the sward. So we had an extra 243 kilos of milk yield and 20 kilos of milk solids per cow on the grass clover treatment relative to the grass only treatment. And the, and the net margin, or the profit per hectare, was increased by 108 euros per hectare. But when we did that analysis a few years ago, it was at a lower milk price um, and a lower fertilizer price than, than, than is current. Um, so if we look at that in terms of current milk price and current protected urea price, that's actually about a 400 euro increase in net profit per hectare relative to the grass only system. Now you know why you should be putting clover in your swards in terms of the fixation uh, benefit, the opportunity to reduce chemical nitrogen, and the milk production benefit, and of course the farm profitability. Now we'll talk about how you get that clover in your system and how you get that clover to work for you in your system. So there's four key things to consider when you're establishing um, a clover on your farm, and these are I suppose the headline um, areas to consider, whether you're over-sowing or reseeding, which are the two main uh, ways of getting clover into the swards. You need to select your paddocks. You need to use medium-leaved cultivars. So for example, Chieftain, uh, Crusader, Iona, Buddy, they're four of them, but they're on the recommended list. Um, when are you going to reseed uh, or over-sow? Ideally, April and May time and then post sowing management is really important. So we look at these in a little bit more detail now for both reseeding and for over sowing. So firstly, in terms of reseeding, really important that you've good soil fertility on the farm or in the paddocks that you're going reseeding. You need to spray off probably seven to 10 days before cultivation to, to, um, to get rid of the old material and the weeds that are potentially in the sward. Uh, in terms of sowing rate, then you're looking at a sowing rate of about three and a half to five kilos of clover per hectare with 28 to 30 kilos of perennial ryegrass picked from the pa pasture profit index to suit your system. So er, April, May, so early, uh, spring, early summer. And the reason for that is, you know, you're still on an increasing plane in terms of temperature. So uh, there's going to be good temperature and it's going to continue to increase to allow um, germination of the seed. There's still moisture in the soil, even in, if you're in a free draining soil that might be prone to a bit of drought later in the summer. You know, the earlier you go in the summer, the more moisture there will be uh, in the spring, uh, the more moisture there will be in the soil. And really importantly, there's plenty of opportunity to get a lot of grazings in before you close that sward for the winter. And the other thing in about going early feeds into the post-sowing management is that there's plenty opportunity to get the clover safe post-emergence spray out. The later you go into the autumn with, over, with reseeding, the less, less of a window you have to get that uh, post-emergence spray out. And the best opportunity you'll have when you, to control weeds in your swards is when you reseed. Uh, the other things then in terms of post-sowing management is to reduce your nitrogen fertilizer for two to three rotations after, after reseeding. Graze the sward as soon as it's fit to be grazed. So do the pull test once, once the grass passes that, go in and graze the sward. So your first grazing should be below 1,000 kilos of dry matter per hectare. It might be as low as six, 700. And after that, for as much of the rest of the year as you can, graze your covers low. So you're going to be skipping into these receded paddocks at 1,000, 1,200 kilos of dry matter per hectare. Then close later in the last rotation. So you're not carrying a heavy cover over the winter. This will allow light to get down to the base of the sward over the winter. For your white clover, you're going to get stole on production. But for your perennial ryegrass, you're getting plenty of opportunity for tillering. And then graze as early as you can in the spring, again, for the same reasons, getting light down to the base of the sward. Okay, so let's have a look then at what we do in terms of over-sowing. So 
In addition to having good soil fertility, which is really important um, uh, when you're, when you're over-sowing clover into the sward, so again, pH of 6.5 at least, maybe a little bit higher, and index 3 at least for P's and K's. You also need to select the paddock you're going to sow, over-sow. So you need a low, a low weed content in that paddock and a high perennial ryegrass sward. You don't want a dense, butty sward with a mat on the, at, the, at the base of it because your clover seed isn't going to get good seed to soil contact. If there's a weed problem in the paddock, you might be better off resolving that, say, this year and then over-sowing next year. The reason being for a lot of... Um, a lot of um, herbicides, there's a withdrawal period, which means that they're still going to be active and may, um, may reduce the success of getting the clover established. In terms of sowing rate, somewhere between four and six kilos of clover seed per hectare. Again, uh, uh, over sow in April, May time for the same reasons as reseeding. And finally, the post sowing management is the same in terms of the grazing management and reducing nitrogen fertilizer on your oversown swards. Then moving now, so we have the clover established on the swards. Okay, it's starting to grow. We want to get it to persist so that we get to the point where it's fixing nitrogen um, and, and it's of benefit in terms of your herbage production and the capacity to reduce chemical fertilizer use. The first thing I'll say is the grazing management rules or targets are the same for a grass clover sward as they are for a grass clover sward. We don't need to make this complicated, we just need to continue with our good grassland management and achieving the targets during the grazing season. So I have a graph here that's showing the evolution of sward clover content um, across the year. So you can see we start off with a low clover content in February in or around 5%. And this increases right through the year to a peak in September of 35, 40%. And then it starts to drop off again. So I'm going to dis discuss the grazing year with that in the background, okay? So firstly, in the spring, clover is making a small contribution to the sward. Um, you need to feed your cows. So the things you need to do here in the spring to, to get the best out of the clover swords is you still need to use your spring rotation planner and you need to adhere to the target. So 30% graze by the end of February, 60% by Patrick's Day and end your first rotation in the first week of April. Get out your slurry and your early nitrogen. You need to feed the cows, you need to grow the grass. Minimize poaching because it can damage the stolons and if we don't have stolons, we'll have no persistence of uh, clover. And then, if you can, graze the reseeds as early as possible in that first rotation. Moving on then to the mid-season, so April to mid-August time, manage your swards, weekly farm cover, sometimes in periods of fast grass growth, you might be going more frequently. Use your wedge to identify surpluses and deficits to manage your pre-grazing yields, which should be somewhere between 13 and 1,500 kilos of dry matter per hectare. Manage your residuals, graze down to four centimetres, and make use of dirty water in this period because it does supply some nitrogen and P and K to the sward. April and May time, take the opportunity to reseed and over sow. Um, and then from May to about August, this is a key period in terms of uh, offering potential to reduce fertilizer um, application on these grass clover swards. And then moving into the autumn, so similar to your grass-only swards, you need to start to build your rotation from about mid-August onwards. Use your autumn planner and the, and the target, so the 60-40 rule, for example, 60% grazed by the 1st of November. Farm closed by the 1st of December. Uh, watch your residuals, try and get down to 3.5 centimetres, if possible, in the last rotation. And graze the reseeds and over swards a bit later in the last rotation. Moving on to fertilizer management. So on the table here, I have um, the rotations. I have the application strategy for grass 250, which we've, which we've moved to um, in line with, with regulations um, since last year. Um, and then the clover 150, okay? First point is, you know, make the best use you can of slurry applied by less in the spring. We get the best return on the nitrogen in the slurry and aim to get slurry out on as much of the farm as possible in early spring. Uh, in terms of fertilizer application on the areas where you don't put, um, you don't put slurry, um, you don't need to go very early with fertilizer, but you do still need to put fertilizer out. So in the first part of the, of the year, so up until April, 
the, fertilizer, the chemical fertiliser application is similar on the grass only and the grass clover swords. Think back to the graph I had for you on the previous slide. Clover is contributing very little to the sward early in the spring. And that's because clover needs a so higher soil temperature to grow relative to grass. It needs about eight degrees, grass needs about five degrees. So the grass will be able to utilize the fertilizer and increase uh, uh, grass growth um, on, on, paddocks, uh, on the paddocks once the fertilizer is supplied. But I suppose then clover starts to come into its own from May, from May. So think back to the graph again, you're on the rising plane of clover content. And this is the period when we can reduce chemical fertilizer use. So we can roughly have it, okay? And this is where we are going to save that 75 to 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. It's from May onwards, okay? And, and I mentioned it already, but I'm going to say it again. You know, don't forget the value of parlor washings and dirty water. Just don't be just disposing of it because you have to empty the tank. Think about where that's going and make good use of the nutrients that are available in that. Okay, a concern around um, incorporating clo clover is often the risk of bloat. So, you know, some, some of the things that can be done to mitigate bloat is try and get clover into all your paddocks so that the cows aren't, aren't switching between grass only and grass clover swards. That'll take time, but there should be a plan there to get that. There needs to be care taken if you're going into a fresh paddock, grass clover paddock, particularly if the cows were um, tight in their previous paddock. And then if there are risk periods, use bloat oil in the water. So that would be like, you know, high clover content, wet morning, dry matter of what the cows are going to be eating is low, um, and there is a, a slight increase in the risk of bloat. Finally, then looking at the on-farm experience in terms of incorporating clover. So Mike Legan and Caitlin Looney have been uh, running the Clover 150 project, which is an on-farm clover study. Uh, it started in 2021, um, and they gave me some data to present here. So they have 36 farmers involved in the project who are using a combination of reseeding and over sowing to get clover onto their swords. Um, and this year, uh, those farms have about 64% of the farm area with clover on them and an average swar clover content of 19%. So the lads um, looked at matched data, so from 2020, 21 and 22 for a number of farms to see what was happening in terms of herbage production and chemical nitrogen use. Okay, so first, the, the, in terms of herbage production, herbage production is similar across the period. Slight reduction in 2022, driven by a drought um, effect that occurred on most of the farms. Um, and then in terms of chemical fertilizer use, so, you know, this is, a, this is a really good result. The farmers who have clover on their swards, they're reducing nitrogen on those, on those swards. And they've reduced their chemical fertilizer use from 2020 to 2022 by about 66 kilos of nitrogen. So like important from this, it didn't affect herbage production, but they were able to reduce their chemical fertilizer use uh, on, on, on their swards because they clover incorporated. So if you've clover in your swards, you can reduce chemical fertilizer use and you need to reduce chemical fertilizer use. So to summarize, uh, white clover, in incorporating it into our systems, offers us huge potential to allow nitrogen fertilizer use to be reduced to farm level. This is positive impacts in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because it'll reduce nitrous oxide emissions. But also we can maintain herbage production when chemical fertilizer um, use is either limited or reduced because we have clover in the swards and we're taking advantage of its natural ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen and supply that to the plant for growth. Clover also increases production per cow and per hectare in terms of milk solids and milk yield uh, and overall contributes to increasing farm profitability. Uh, so altogether, clover offers a, a significant um, Opt, uh, opportunity for farmers to increase both the economic and the environmental sustainability of their systems through the reduction in chemical fertilizer use uh, and the, the increased milk production uh, and maintaining herbage production. So thanks very much. All right, thanks very much, Deirdre, for that. And I think that was really comprehensive, right through from the why to, to how you do it. 
The key message that I would take home from that is it's a win-win for us in terms of um, milk output and, and economic sustainability and also for the environment and, and, and um, reduction in cost. But I think having the confidence to reduce nitrogen where you are putting in clover, I think is key to that. And it's something we will come back to with Michael later on to tease out with him how he's building his confidence, confidence to reduce nitrogen input. I'll take one or two questions for Deirdre um, and then we'll come back to a panel discussion later on. Um, over here, Mike, please. Here, Liz, in the front. Um, Ronald Shorten. Um, there's a problem going forward. There's a risk of a ban on gross glyphosate and we can't plow in the middle of the season. Where do you see um, this going? Um, yeah, good comment. So um, I suppose we still are going to have to re rejuvenate our swords, um, both from a perennial ryegrass point of view and from, from, um, from uh, an over sowing and getting clover into the systems. Um, if we can't spray our paddocks off and we can't plough, we ha we'll have to go with minimum cultivation and we'll have to use post-emergent spray. We absolutely will have to use post-emergent spray. Um, we did do um, a, a demonstration at Moor Park for, for some of the open days over the last few years. And what we saw there was that the, the failure to apply a post-emergent spray was having a bigger effect than, um, than uh, using Roundup are not using, sorry, they're not using Roundup. So look, our hands are being tied in lots of different ways, but we just have to work around trying to, um, trying to deal with those. The other thing that's really important is getting our soil fertility right, because if we get our soil fertility right, the productive species in our swords, the perennial ryegrass and the white clover, they will outcompete a lot of the weeds, um, and they will help us to maintain more productive sward, even in the scenario you're talking about. So a lot of the weed grasses that, um, that um, establish in reseeded swards, a lot of them are annuals, so with good grazing management they can be dealt with. For the more, for the more perennial ones, um, they're not as productive, particularly in the shoulders. So if we can get our perennial ryegrass dominating the sward in the shoulders and manage it through the grazing season, uh, we'll minimise the impact of those. All right, I think we'll leave it. Um, we just just it. on uh, Ray Clover, have you done any study on that for, on, on, for silages? Yeah, so we have a new program of work ongoing at Moor Park with Red Clover. There has been other work done previously in Grange, and Red Clover offers a very good option for um, silage, uh, high quality silage, and you have the added benefit of um, uh, eliminate, almost eliminating the requirement for chemical fertilizer on Red Clover silage swords. Okay, thank you, Deirdre. We will have a panel discussion at the end. So our second speaker is Mike Deneen, and Mike is a research officer at Moor Park, and his paper is Nutrition of the, the Cow in a, in a High-Quality Pasture Scenario. Uh, thanks very much, Siobhan. Um, so um, nice to, to, to be here today and to present you. Um, the title of the presentation is to Increasing Book Production Efficiency from Pasture-Based Systems. So there's four main topics we're going to cover over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the first, we'll be uh, discussing the nutritional benefits of the optimal pre-grazing yield. We'll then talk about the nutritional benefits of white clover. We'll touch briefly on the protein requirements of the grazing dairy cow. And then we'll wrap up with some strategic supplementation guidelines and some considerations to keep in mind when supplementing. So before we dive in, there's two terms I want to uh, briefly orientate you with uh, bef before we get going with the presentation. The first is, is pasture cell wall, or what we commonly refer to it as, as fibre. So in our pastures, we've, we've many plants, and these plants are made up of plant cells. Um, inside in the centre of the plant cell is the cell contents, and this material is very, very digestible and very protein and energy dense. Uh, around the outside of the cell is the cell wall, and this is where the, where the fiber is, is comprised. Um, the cell wall is made up of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, 
and these materials are usually the more slowly or lo lower nutritive value uh, components in our diets compared to the cell contents. So we try to minimize the amount of cell wall or fiber in our diets. The second term is organic matter digestibility or OMD. So OMD is the main metric we use here in Ireland to quantify the quality of our swords or the quality of the diet. OMD is essentially how much of the feed has, can be digested and absorbed. So to calculate it, we quantify how much the cow ate, how much came out the back end of her, and then through a simple calculation, we determine the OMD. And OMD usually ranges from about 65 to 85%. So fiber and OMD will be used here throughout the presentation. I just wanted to orientate you to that. So first, the nutritional benefits of optimal pre-grazing yields. So one of the main reasons we perform grassland uh, measurement and management is to try to keep our swards in an immature state or the tree leaf stage. This is typically a pre-grazing yield of 14 to 1600 kgs of dry matter per hectare. By doing that, we reduce the amount of cell wall in our swards and we improve the amount of cell contents in the diet. This typically leads to more digestible swards. We refer to them as uh, having higher quality. They have low fiber, uh, less than 35%. They have high OMD, over 80%, and they provide a lot of energy and, and protein supply to our grazing dairy cow. If our wedge gets out of hand, if growth rates uh, um, start to shoot up during the main grazing season, and we don't rectify our wedge, we enter into periods where we have more mature swards um, that have higher uh, proportions of cell contents, or sorry, cell walls, and less amount of cell contents. So we move our diet into a more lower nutritional value, it has lower digestibility, um, high amounts of fiber, over 40%. It has lower OMD or digestibility, less than 75. And ultimately, we give our cows less energy and protein by giving that higher pre-grazing yield material to them. So in an experiment in Moore Park, we um, took this optimal pre-grazing yield and we fed it to cows. Uh, we quantified how much they ate and how much fiber went into their rumen and then we determined how much they digested or how, how, what was their capacity to break down this optimal pre-grazing yield. So we found that over 70% of the fiber was broken down in the rumen and over 80% of it was broken down on a total tract basis. So if we were to compare, compare this to an indoor feeding system or a TMR system, the rumen number is usually 40 to 50% compared to over 70 and on a total tract basis, the number is usually 50 to 60% compared to over 80%. So it just demonstrates the capacity these cows have to break down um, pasture when we offer it to them in the right form. So during that experiment, we also took some samples and, and, and just visually assessed them, what did they look like when they were leaving the rumen. And we found that there was long vascular strands of this lignified indigestible material left behind and that was flowing out of the rumen. So it was just demonstrating again the microbes inside in the cow's rumen had massive capacity to strip away the digestive material, break it down into forms uh, for energy and protein value to the cow, and it just demonstrates the, the, the massive capacity these cows have to break down the feed when we give it to them in the right form. So to help understand what's happening in the rumen, when we give our cows these optimal pre-grazing yields, there's a, a small amount of indigestible material in, in, in the plant, there's a small amount of slowly degrading or, or um, cell wall material in, in the diet. And then there's a large proportion of rapidly digestible, highly fermentable material that the microbes can get into straight away, start breaking it down and make it disappear from the rumen. By making it disappear from the rumen, it creates space and it stimulates the cow to have another meal and to have a large meal. So it stimulates her throughout the day to eat a lot and achieve a high dry matter intake. When we give the cows the higher pre-grazing yields or the, the lower feed value material, there's a greater proportion of slowly degrading and indigestible material in that sward. And there's a smaller proportion of uh, fastly degrading uh, material or the stuff we want to disappear. So then across the day, the microbes and the cow have a, a lower capacity to, to digest this and, and create space in the rumen, and the cow will be stimulated less throughout the day to eat and, and uh, will have a lower uh, meal size. So ultimately across the day, she'll achieve a lower dry matter intake. So our goal as farmers is to give this optimal pre-grazing yield of 14 to 1600 to our cows, 
It will keep up pasture digestibility. It will, um, it will stimulate high dry matter intake and through higher digestibility and intake, the cow will be able, the cow and her rumen will create a lot of uh, volatile fatty acid production, which is the main energy supply to the cow. It will grow a lot of microbes, which is the main protein supply to the cow, and ultimately it will drive higher milk solids yield. So when we look at, at pasture-based Ireland data for, for the main grazing season and look at what we're currently achieving, we find that about 35% of the farmers are hitting these optimal targets or are grazing less than 1,600, whereas 65% are grazing slightly higher or, or too high in terms of pre-grazing yields. So there's lots of opportunity there to drop down our pre-grazing yield into the optimal and kind of uh, utilize or maximize the potential of our swards. So moving on to the nutritional benefits of, of white clover. So some, um, uh, in a nice experiment performed by uh, Dr. Deirdre Hennessy and her team in Moorpark, uh, they compared grass only to grass white clover swards. Uh, for this graph, we're looking at the amount of fiber in the diet. So when we look at the grass only sward, we found that there was um, low amounts of fiber in the spring, there was moderate amounts in the summer, and there was high levels of fiber in the autumn. So deteriorating sward quality across the grazing season, and this usually reflects why our autumn swards have a, are perceived to have a lower nutritional value. When white clover was introduced into the sward, we find a consistent reduction in fiber content across the seasons. So we see, can see in the spring, summer, and autumn, white clover was able to bring down the amount of fiber in the diet, and we see the greatest effect in the autumn when we have our highest clover content. So Deirdre would alluded to the clover content across the year. So we can see uh, very um, um, uh, advantageous effects of including white clover in terms of cell wall. When we look at digestibility, or OMD, we find that OMD is highest in the spring for our grass-only swards, and then it drops throughout the season. So it, it's moderate in the summer and lower in the autumn, and again referring to the poorer feed value of our autumn swards. By including white clover in the sward, uh, there was no real difference in the spring. Uh, clover content is quite low in the spring, so we wouldn't expect a huge difference there. But as we move through the grazing season, white clover was able to maintain our organic matter digestibility or maintain highly digestible swards in the summer and the autumn. So it was able to keep up the feed value of the pastures we were giving to our cows across the grazing season. So when we look at the systems data in, in Clonakilty and Moorpark, how do these beneficial uh, nutritional value effects affect the animal? So when we look at the, the intake uh, data across both farms, we find that the cows uh, consistently increase their dry matter intake, specifically in the summer and autumn, which coincides with the higher clover contents. We find the range of about half a kilo to 0.8 kilos more dry matter intake per cow um, across the grazing season, and this is when the clover contents were on average 20% across the year. So by having clover in the sward, we we're able to stimulate that higher dry matter intake coming from the higher digestibility and lower uh, fiber or cell wall. When we look at the milk production, we also see um, beneficial effects on animal performance. We can see, um, looking at the lactation profile, as the cows move into that summer and autumn period, we start to see the divergence in milk solids with white clover improving milk solids production for these grazing dairy cows. Uh, again, it coincides with as clover content increases, we start to see that difference in milk solids yield. And when we look at the data uh, that we've gathered so far, there's a range of about an additional 20 to 40 kilos of milk solids per cow when clover content is higher than 20% on average across the year. And Deirdre would alluded to the economic responses of achieving that higher milk production performance. So lots of benefits by, uh, in terms of animal performance by including white clover in our swards. So moving on to the protein requirements of the grazing dairy cow. So when we offer these cows uh, our pasture-based diets, um, the cow consumes this material and it enters into the rumen. The microbes will then attach to the material and they'll start breaking it down. They'll start converting it into smaller molecules and converting it to energy supply for the cows. They'll also start to break down the protein. They'll use it for themselves to grow and reproduce and, and create daughter cells. Um, and this will provide protein to the cow but they'll also break down excess protein uh, in the rumen and they'll convert it to ammonia. Uh, th that ammonia, as it builds up in the rumen, it's absorbed across the rumen wall and it goes to the cow's liver, 
and in the liver she'll detoxify this ammonia and convert it to urea. The urea is then shuttled through the blood and it gets to the kidney and when it gets to the kidney the cow has a decision to make. Uh, she needs to understand has she too little protein or too much protein in her system. If she's too much protein she's going to excrete it in the urine. It'll come out in the urine as urea and it'll end up in the urine patch on the ground. The other way she'll get rid of it is she'll secrete it in the milk. So she'll elevate her milk urea nitrogen levels to get rid of the excess uh, protein in the system. And then finally, if she's in a situation where she is um, almost balanced or slightly deficient for protein, she's evolved to recycle it back into the system and not to waste that protein that she ate. So she'll recycle it through the blood back into the rumen and it'll help keep her microbes happy and it'll help keep them digesting the feed and supplying nutrients to the cow. So as nutritionists and farmers, we're trying to create a situation where we minimize the excess protein in the diet. We don't want it coming out in the urine. It can have negative environmental effects, such as uh, reducing air and water quality and increasing greenhouse gases. We don't want to put a lot of it into the milk, as it'll hurt uh, Connor Galvin there this morning and their side of the house, it'll reduce um, milk processability. And then we want to hit a certain level where we don't hamper animal performance and, and reduce milk solids yield. So an experiment uh, performed in Moore Park by Dr. Eva Lewis and, and her team, they looked at um, the crude protein concentrate of the diet. So it's one way we can control how much protein the cow consumes. So they looked at high protein rations of 25%, uh, moderate protein rations of 18%, and low protein rations of 8%. And what they found was that as they dropped the protein level in the ration, there was no uh, reduction in animal performance. There was no difference in milk yield, there was no effect on milk fat or milk crude protein, and there was no effect on milk solids yield. So it would give you confidence to reduce the crude protein uh, content of the ration when supplementing. There is now work generated by AFABI up the north and, and UCD in Lyons Estate, and they found similar uh, responses that as they reduce uh, crude protein content of the ration, there is no effect on animal performance. It's important to point that these concentrates are balanced for minerals. So if you're looking at the low protein rations, uh, there might be thought processes to use straights. If doing so, make sure to balance for, for your minerals and, and make sure that side of the house is covered. And then there's currently work ongoing in terms of what happens in a drought situation when grass crude protein can drop. We're investigating that at the moment, and we're also looking at the is the type of protein important, so rumen degradable versus rumen undegradable. So just our, our last topic for, for this presentation is strategic supplementation, and we'll just go through some guidelines and considerations when supplementing. So I suppose the objective of supplementing in, in pasture-based systems is to use supplement to fill our feed deficits on the shoulders of the year. So in the spring, we'll use concentrate and silage to help um, meet the, the deficit in the spring, and then in the autumn, we'll use deferred pasture from building covers, we'll introduce some silage, and we'll also use concentrate in these shoulders. Um, I suppose the important thing is that we're, we're trying our best to align the herd's demand with the grass growth potential of the farm and, and try just use supplement for these shoulders where possible. So in some uh, comprehensive economic analysis done by uh, Elodie Ruel and Lawrence Chalou, they found that on average, the financial optimum supplementation level was about 600 kgs of concentrate per cow per year when milk price was moderate to high. So in a low milk price scenario, this um, average concentrate level reduced, but on the moderate to high level milk price, around 600 kilos was the sweet spot. So what does that look like across the year? Um, so the figure on the right just shows that uh, around in February and March, around three to four kilos seems the financial optimum. As we go into the main grazing season, we try to reduce our concentrate and maximize the amount of high quality digestible pasture in the cow's diet. And then as we move on to the back end, where we're trying to build cover and extend the grazing season, we reintroduce about two kilos of concentrate to help extend that grazing season. So it's important to point out that not all years are the same and there'll be different deficits across the year. There'll also be droughts but it's important to, to kind of sit down and consider how much concentrate you're supplementing each year. And if you're uh, consistently uh, supplementing high levels of concentrate, it, it'd be good to look at the stocking rate of the farm and the growth potential and are the two aligned. So when supplementing, there's a couple of considerations to, to keep in mind. Uh, the first one is substitution rate. 
So if we're in a situation like the spring where we have low grass availability uh, and we've about 14 kilos that we can offer our cows, uh, when we give them four kilos of concentrate, they'll slightly reduce their grass intake. So they'll drop back their grass intake by about one kilo and they'll increase their total dry matter intake. So in this situation, we have a low substitution rate. Uh, the substitution rate is 0.25. They dropped out one kilo of pasture for the four kilos of concentrate. So this is a, a, a positive situation where concentrate supplementation is, is being utilized well. In the second scenario, where we have high grass availability, uh, it's very digestible and high quality pasture. We're in the main grazing season and we're offering the cows about 17 kilos of pasture. When we then give them four kilos of concentrate, they'll have a large substitution rate. They'll drop back three kilos of pasture uh, they'll only slightly increase their, their dry matter intake and there'll be ultimately a high substitution rate of 0.75. And this leads to poor economic outcomes and poor milk response to supplementation. So it's important to consider substitution rate when um, considering what level of concentrate to feed. The, um, in another experiment in, in Moore Park, just referring to that one where we quantified how much fibre digested in the cow's rumen, uh, our second treatment was where we gave the cows three kilos of rolled barley. The first thing we noticed when we gave the rolled barley is that we had a large substitution rate of 0.66. So when we gave the cows the three kilos of rolled barley, they dropped back their dry matter intake of pasture by two kilos, and that resulted in the 0.66 substitution rate. When we looked at their room and fiber digestion, we found a 9% reduction in their digestibility. So this rolled barley was in, uh, hampering the cows and the, and the microbes' ability to break down cell wall. So we had a, a, a large substitution rate and also a negative associated effect of reduced digestibility, both in the rumen and also on a total tract basis. So a 9% reduction on total tract as well. The final consideration when supplementing is the, the milk response we get to supplementing. So an experiment performed in Kilworth uh, last spring, Chris Heffernan's down the crowd there that, that led the study. Um, we looked at different levels of, of supplementation levels. So we went from zero, just uh, offering the cows a, a mineral packet, um, increasing to two kilos of dry matter of supplement, and increasing further to four kilos of supplement. And what we found was that there was a diminishing response to that supplement. So the response we got for the first two kilos was about 0.9 kilos of milk per kilo of, of supplement. But as we gave them an additional two kilos, we didn't get a similar response. It wasn't a linear response to the supplement. It was a diminishing uh, response. And we found that in both milk yield and also milk solids yield. So again, an important consideration when determining how much supplement to give the cows. There are other factors that can affect this milk response, like pasture availability that we touched on. Uh, pasture quality, the type of cow, and also the type of ingredients in the concentrate, and they can affect that milk response. And on average, across six experimental data sets over the last few years in Moore Park, we found a response of about 0.9 kilos of milk per kilo of concentrate dry matter. So again, important consideration when determining uh, how much to, to supplement. So just to summarize, um, in order to optimize milk production efficiency from pasture-based systems, it's important that we focus on consistently delivering 14 to 1600 kgs of dry matter per hectare. We see the nutritional benefits of doing this uh, across the year. It's very important to incorporate white clover. We see the improvement in animal performances, the ability to reduce chemical nitrogen, and the enhanced economic profitability of the systems. Um, we're confident to say low crude protein concentrates will maintain milk solids production, and it can also help reduce environmental nitrogen emissions. So um, that's a positive story as well, uh, and to be confident to go with the lower protein rations. And then the final one is to be mindful of diminishing milk response when supplementing and the other considerations that I touched on. So with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for that. In the interest of time, we might just hold questions to the general discussion because I'm just conscious that we're... We're at 20 to 1, and I know people will be starting to get hungry. The main point I would take out of Michael's presentation, I'll go back to his first take-home message, was the optimum pre-grazing yields. Worryingly, when you look at the pasture-based data, only 35% of herds are achieving that through the main, main season. So there's a lot of work to be done on the basics. And when we talk about 
um, farming in a low nitrogen input system, we always talk about clover and liming and, and um, better use of slurry. But basics like getting um, grassland right, um, optimising our, our grazing, grazing, pre-grazing pre yields and strategic use of nitrogen are so important as well. So we have to, can't get away from the basics either when, when, we're, when we're in the scenario that we're facing into. Our last, last speaker this morning, our last contributor, is Michael Gowan. Michael is a, a dairy farmer uh, here from Kilworth and Cork who has a lot of experience in clover in the last couple of years. And what Michael is going to do this morning is share his experiences of, of clover, clover with you. But before Michael comes to the podium, we just have a short little video um, just kind of introducing Michael's farm and where he's at um, with clover at the moment. Uh, the reason I chose to, to incorporate clover here was because uh, I, I think it's only a matter of time before we're going to be forced into uh, into less fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer use. So the, the, the follow on from that is that we're going to grow less grass and the uh, quality of the grass in mid-season is going to reduce. So there are neg that, that will have a negative uh, impact on the finances of, of the farm. So what I'm hoping to do is to incorporate clover into the farm to, to fix the nitrogen um, and by fixing nitrogen for the grass it's going to replace artificial nitrogen and the silver lining on that is that it will also uh, uh, reduce my fertilizer costs for the year. Um, the advice I'd give to farmers would be uh, I suppose first of all to get the soil fertility correct, get the pHs up to 6.4 and 6.5 and, and so on and uh, to get the, the P and K indexes up to 3 and 4 after that, it's about establishing the, the clover in the sward, um, either by reseeding or over sowing. Reseeding is probably the best and most reliable way of doing it, um, but it's, it, it can be very slow. It could take a good number of years to do it. So some form of over sowing w should be incorporated into it. After that, it's about uh, educating yourself as to how to, how to uh, manage the clover afterwards. Uh, I suppose the best advice I could give to anybody would be to learn from others that ha are already gone down that road. The challenges I've faced, uh, w there aren't too many of them. Um, one challenge would be that over the next couple of years I'm going to have uh, grass only swords and grass clover swords so I'm going to have to have two management strategies for each. Um, there's always there's going to be a challenge on over, with over sowing. It's a little bit hit and miss. Um, to be honest, the biggest challenge I faced was in my own headspace, in the, um, trying to convince myself that first of all that it was the right thing to do, and secondly that I would have confidence in my own ability to manage the thing afterwards. I think that there are enough templates out there in terms of research farms and commercial farms. That, uh, that have already made a success of this and uh, from now on I intend to follow what's going on in those farms. Well, I'm very early in, in the journey, uh, but at the moment I'm confident that I can make a success of it. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for that and I think it was a really good introdu introduction to, to this um, discussion now. I take three C's out of that. One is a change of attitude or a change of mindset. And I think we all have to make that change of mindset to, to, to I suppose, succeed in a lower nitrogen input um, system going forward. The second one is the commitment that's needed, and there is a huge commitment needed. It's one thing putting clover in your, in your grass mixes. It's another thing to actually commit to managing it and looking after that over the next couple of years so that you have a good incorporation of clover. And the third one then is to have the confidence to be able to reduce the nitrogen. And Deirdre spoke about this earlier, but to have that confidence and where do you get that confidence from? And Michael touched on it. It's making use of the information or the people that are around you. So the people in the research centers on the, the signpost farms who are making progress in this area, the farmers that are on those demo farms as well. So that's what I would take out of what Michael has said so far. Michael, just before we go to a general discussion, I just have a few questions for you specifically. You mentioned soil fertility and Deirdre mentioned as well in the context of establishing clover and also from a weed control point of view. Just maybe talk about soil fertility on your own farm um, and how do you got to where you are today with it? Um, th thanks, Siobhan. Um, nothing special about what we've done. We were lucky enough that there used to be a piggery on the farm, so we started off with a high level, but um, 
maintaining soil fertility is a crucial part of, of incorporating clover and uh, so we would continuously uh, monitor that and do soil tests uh, at least every two years okay. if not every year sometimes and what's the status of your farm at the moment or you... uh, we're mostly mostly index fours for p and k okay and ph or ph is uh, about 6.6 okay okay so that's soil sampling every couple of years and making best use of your nutrient management plan yeah. Okay. The sec just as a follow on to that then, when you're selecting paddocks for, for incorporating clover and you're either reseeding or you're, you're over sowing, can you just talk us through your thought process in doing that? Okay, so, so initially, I'm only at the, at the clover thing with three years, so initially the plan was to reseed about 10% and over sow 15% mm -hmm. a year. Um, and so we started off doing that. Um, the receding, uh, the receding with clover, I find that brilliant. It's bulletproof. Okay. It will absolutely work. Um, the oversawing can be hit and miss. And uh, I, I wouldn't be a great advertisement now for oversawing because in general, I have to go back a second year mm. to try and, and improve the clover content in the farm. And that leads to its own difficulties in that. Once I oversaw a paddock, it, it goes into a priority category. And like Deirdre said, the, the oversawed paddocks, they have to be grazed at you know, roughly mm -hmm. about a 1,000. Um, uh, and so once I have a number of those paddocks at a 1,000, they have to be grazed. Yeah. And that's fine for a small percentage of the farm. But if you have to re-oversaw again the following year, you have suddenly you have a bigger percentage of the farm that's in your priority mm -hmm. category. And so once those hit a thousand, you have to raise those. And that comes at the expense of if you have non-clover paddocks then that are at the ideal fourteen hundred. Yeah. You know, within a couple of days they are sixteen, seventeen, eighteen hundred. So uh, at times I got into a bit of a tailspin with that and and there was a lesson learned there, yeah. Okay. Georgia, do you want to just comment on that, the over versus the, the receding, and that, that challenge of grazing the lower covers where you have a lot of it going in? Yeah, and I think Michael's kind of hit on some of it anyway, Siobhan, but, like, you know, if you have a re uh, receded area, you're going to have to manage that for the rest of the year, uh, so a bit of priority management. But likewise, with the, with the over just to get that clover to establish. So I suppose, in terms of getting clover onto your farm, it's about having a plan. Like you, you should have a rough idea of what you intend to reseed every year and then maybe over so 15%. So, you know, at most you're having to priority manage 20 to 25% of the, of the farm. The problem is if you go to a bigger area, like Michael said, then you, you know, you have to graze that as soon as you get to it. And then two things happen, either the area that you're not priority manage, managing, as Michael said, you end up with a high cover on that or you're going to end up with high covers on your over area and you're just going to reduce the capacity of that sward to get a good clover establishment. So, you know, farmers who go with big, big area of their farm in one year, they do run into bother and they do end up having to go back again the following year to, to over -sow. So, you know, have a four or five year plan to get there, you know, yeah. 20 to 25 percent per year rather than trying to do it all in one or two years. So that's fundamental, having your plan yeah. day one yeah. so that you know. So anybody, Deirdre, that's starting right now, thinking of next year, what do they need to be doing? Yeah, so look, if you're thinking about over sowing or reseeding with clover next year, you know, sit down now and make a plan. Identify your paddocks. You know, you can use pasture base to identify your poor performing paddocks. They probably need to be reseeded anyway. Uh, soil sample. If you haven't taken your soil samples already, go and do them. But get, when you get your soil sample results back, sit down and look at them mm. and make a plan then for how you're going to address any deficiencies that are there for the coming year. Um, and then aim to, to go in April it, with, with over sowing and with reseeding. And, you know, the ground will be out for a while, but you're in a period of high grass growth. Your, your over sown ground won't be out of, the, out of the grazing system at all, but then you have to have your plan to be able to skip into that in the rotation. Jesus. So you won't be following your 20-day rotation on that paddock. You might be back in there 14, 16 days, certainly for a few rotations. So, you know, as things quieten down a little bit now, sit down, make the plan, make sure you have your soil sample results and make your fertilizer, fertilizer plan accordingly. Okay, all right. 
Before I go to the audience for questions, I just want to deal with the bloat issue, and I know, Deirdre, you raised it. It's a very real concern for a lot of people. We've heard a lot of reports in the media in recent times of people that have had issues with it, and I just want to trash it out a little bit before we, before we move on. I might go to you first, Mike, just to explain why, it ha why we have bloat, Do you know, the, the science behind it, or the biology behind it. Yeah, no, no problem, Siobhan. Um, so the type of bloat we get is kind of the frothy, foamy bloat. So as the cow eats this uh, very digestible pasture, it breaks down the rumen, and, and that digestion creates gas. Uh, the type of soluble protein in legumes then create this um, kind of a film that traps the gas bubbles, and then that causes the pressure in the cow's rumen. So uh, I suppose the, the couple of mitigation strategies, just the biology of that, so the bloat oil is one strategy, so that's an anti-foaming agent. It breaks down those, those uh, coatings and releases the gas, and then the other suggestion sometimes is the, the two-hour wire. So what that does is it gets the cows to graze down into the sward. They start to consume some of the cell wall material that's further down the sward, rather than picking the highest digestibility pasture across the paddock. And that slows down the rate of digestion and the rate of gas production and helps mitigate some of that bloat issue. Okay, okay. Michael, in your case, how do you manage the risk of bloat? Um, so Siobhan, I suppose, to reiterate, I'm just three years into it, and the first year I was terrified of it, I, I'd be honest. So like most people, I'd, I'd imagine. Yeah. I, I did the bulletproof method, I, I used bloat oil and, and quite a bit of it, um, even though I had only a small percentage of, of the farm covered in clover at the time. Um, I'm getting a bit braver as time goes on. The first year, as I say, I used bloat oil. The, secondly, the second year, I used less bloat oil and more kind of um, uh, strategic management of mm the swords that they were going into, and this year I've used no bloat oil. And when you say um, the strategic management, what exactly are you doing to... Um, so, first of all, I'd identify the paddocks that I thought were, were of danger to the cows, as we said, the high clover yep. content um, in each paddock. And um, with those, I tend to uh, use a strip wire, and if I thought it, there was extreme danger there, I'd give them what's called uh, a, a breakfast break, give them an hour and a half or, or two hours of a split in the, at the start of the paddock and uh, where they have to eat the, the, the fiber, uh, as, as Mike has said, they, they'll graze that down to the butt and they'll have fiber in them, then I'll take down the fence and then I'll let them in over the rest of the paddock. And uh, in general, that, that, that has worked for me. But it's about being consistent, isn't it? It's about being on top of this the whole time. Oh yeah, 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 yeah you really, you, yes, you have to be on top of it, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to open up this up to the floor, so I'm sure there's plenty of questions for our panel. Ma John, down the back. Any of the, Mi any of the Michaels? How does a small bit of stra straw work? Because the feedback from farmers is given access to straw in danger periods, even a small bit of straw does prevent. And all I'd say to Michael going is three years in, and, you know, we know people, because we're in the same group, that have been in a lot of clover for a lot of years, and bang, you suddenly get a perfect storm, and, yeah. Yeah, so Mike. on the straw question, um, so it's similar principles to that two-hour war. You're trying to get the cows to consume more fibrous material that breaks down slower or re creates gas at a slower rate. My concern with the straw would be it's fairly low in nutritional value, and it's going to replace some of the pasture that the cows would be eating. So the supply of energy and protein to your cows will be slightly reduced and it could hamper some performance. So just to be mindful, maybe if, you, if you're really concerned, high quality surplus bales, they, they give fiber, and uh, not as much fiber as straw, but they might um, uh, achieve the same objective. Okay, all right, thanks Mike. Um, another question yeah, back here. I would uh, share the preference for medium leaved clover. Um, in your advice, Deirdre, is it advisable to stay away from uh, the small leaf clover, such as cold fin and those uh, types? Yeah, so uh, the recommendation for cattle grazing is medium leafed cultivars. Uh, the smaller leafed cultivars are more, uh, they grow lower in the sward, so they don't contribute to what the cow grazes. They work fine for sheep because sheep graze tighter. You mentioned cool fin there, that's, that's the largest of the small leaved cultivars and I suppose it's closer to medium leaf uh, in terms of leaf size than the smaller, so it seems to work fine in uh, cattle grey swords, but the very small leaf, yeah, they'll fix a certain amount of clover in the sward, but they won't 
be in what the cow eats, so they won't be contributing uh, to the nutrition of the cow. Thanks, Deirdre. Got a question over here, yeah. everyone, or behind? Sorry. Yeah, for Deirdre. Um, a few questions there, Deirdre. How far can you push the boundaries of nitrogen, um, like James Humphreys and Solihead uh, feels that you can reduce it even further, especially in the autumn, uh, obviously not in the spring, if you want to get some better herbage when the clover isn't there. Also, he recommends two kilos of red with two kilos of white per acre in a reseed. You might give your view on that. And also considering the extremely wet October, November we had, what proportion of the farm should it be in clover? Because like you have to leave the paddocks later in there so you don't have car not carrying a cover over the winter. And like in my own case, there, there's clover paddocks being grazed currently because we just couldn't go into them until now. Uh, you might comment on that, please. Yeah, so good few questions there. So in terms of the nitrogen boundaries, look, all the research that we're doing in Chagas, we have clover research on in Moor Park, in Solihead, in Clonakilty, in Ballyhays, and in Curtains. And the objective of all of that research is to increase clover use on farms to reduce chemical nitrogen fertilizer. They, they're all looking at different levels of nitrogen. Um, nitrogen fertilizer or different reductions in fertilizer. Um, there, we certainly may have more opportunity in the summer period to reduce nitrogen. Um, I would say in terms of shoulder growth, there is a requirement, um, I suppose, for supply of herbage um, and, we need to, and we need to feed that herbage. In terms of the red clover um, in the reseeds for grazing, so well, red clover ideally um, is a silage cultivar. It doesn't persist very well under grazing. Um, it, yes, it will establish but it will disappear again out of the sward because it's a different growth habit to white clover. Uh, its growing point is much higher in the sward and um, the cows will nip it when they graze down to four centimetres, so it will disappear. Um, and then the last one in terms of the area of the farm, like ideally the whole farm would be in, um, would be in white clover uh, to get the, the real benefits in the system. Uh, in terms of the wet weather that we've had this year, yeah, I suppose it has been challenging for a lot of farmers to graze, um, graze their swards. In, in a well-established sward, though, you know, using the normal grassland management routines and on-off grazing where necessary, the same as you would in the spring, uh, will minimise the damage. Um, and, you know, you still need to try, whether it's, whether it's a white clover sward or whether it's a grass-only sward, you do try, need to try and meet your targets in terms of grazing off into the autumn um, so that you have grass of good quality going into the, going into the spring. So I suppose in that, in that scenario, if you're concerned about damaging the clover swards, you have to try and take the opportunities like you're taking now to graze your, your, your clover swards. But it, ideally, we should be aiming to have all our, all our milking platform under clover. Okay, thank you, Deirdre. Question here at the front. Can I please ask you to stand up? The camera crew have asked me to. Um, so, Cahal uh, Middleton. Um, Michael Dean, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I suppose what I didn't hear enough of, and what sometimes gets forgotten in the discussion about good grassland management, optimizing grass usage is the actual requirements and demands of the cow herself. Like in that February to April period, um, her energy demand is highest and it doesn't match or dry matter intake. So I suppose what I'd like to know, let's say with the experiment there on zero, two, and four kilos of concentrate being fed, was there a different scene or did you gather that data on let's say body condition score loss, but also then number of cows and calf, what, were, what was left at the end of the day? Because I suppose it just really is so important to remember in early lactation, February to April, cows energy demand is highest, which is ne never gonna eat enough grass to match that energy demand. Thanks very much for the question. Um, so we did measure body condition score and body weight. Uh, there was no difference among the three treatments. Um, you saw the slightly lower milk production as concentrate um, reduced. So she's able to look after herself uh, with the high quality pasture and the concentrate, but where she'll pull back a little bit is on the, on the milk production. Um, in terms of fertility, so that experiment was um, 180 cows. For fertility experiments, you need to do much larger amount of cows over a number of years, so it's hard to, to pull it apart. But anecdotally, when we looked at the 60 cows on each treatment, there was no difference in terms of, of fertility. 
And then the, the last point, I suppose, is just um, when we think about uh, offering this high-quality pasture, getting clover into it, it's uh, very, very high in terms of UFL and PDI. Uh, the cow that's performing well will eat a lot of that material, and she can meet a lot of her nutrient demands um, by giving her that high-quality pasture. And we'd see it year in, year out. In, in the more practical clonicility data, the cows are delivering 500 kilos of milk soils and they're achieving very high fertility performance. So um, I'd just be, uh, if you're giving a high quality pasture with a moderate amount of supplement, I think the cow can meet her, her requirements for a given amount of, of milk production and maintain health and fertility. Okay. Michael, can I just ask you a question? Um, uh, in terms of milk production, how are you seeing it? Have you seen any difference in terms of milk production since you incorporated clover into uh, So um, the first two years, not really. There was a slight increase the, the second year. But this year, the second year, we, were, we produced 488 kilos of milk soil as a cow. And this year, we'll be at 520. That's without, we haven't milked any longer, extended the lactation to achieve that. And look, there are different years, and I can't claim that it's down to clover, but mm. my gut instinct is that a proportion of it is, is down to uh, clover in, in the swords. Okay. What, what do you see yourself as, as the biggest challenge to incorporate <coughs> clover into your grassland system? Um, I suppose being, being brave enough yeah. and kind of... Uh, being brave enough and bold enough to take the first step is probably the, the biggest thing. You know, once you take the first step and work off of one, two, three paddocks, um, I found anyway that I started to build confidence in what the clover was able to contribute to the farm. And it kind of snowballed after that, and I, I kept going. Okay, so be brave. But that, that means keeping yourself engaged with what's happening in research on the signpost farms and other demonstration farms, and your discussion group obviously is a big part to play there, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. L to be fair, I think there's, there's a huge amount of enthusiasm within Chagask for, for, um, um, in, for promoting this clover. Yeah. And like, I've got a, a lot of, um, of advice you know, from within Chagask, Caitlin Looney, Mike Egan, James Humphreys, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm there, yep. and I've tapped into that, and, and I think all the way down to, to uh, advisors on the ground, there's huge enthusiasm there, and I yeah. think, you know... But you have to it, tap into the... But you have to tap into it, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, any other questions? Sorry, question here. Uh, Pat Hoburn, I just have one question in the context of uh, the nutrition side here in a minute. Uh, roughly about 20 years ago, using uh, <coughs> grass clover swords. We used to run into issues, particularly with the silages in the winter time, with dicumarol. Now, as a chemical, as you know, that creates vitamin K deficiency and can give rise to fertility issues. So have you any information with regard to its level in the varieties of clover nowadays? So to my knowledge, we don't uh, in the modern research, uh, unless there's older research, no. Um, We've been feeding, um, I suppose, in the Clannacilty context, we've been feeding uh, white clover silage since 2013. We haven't seen impairment in fertility performance over the years. Similar in Moor Park, white clover silage has been fed. But has yeah. dicumarol been analysed for as a chemical present? We haven't. No, no. we haven't determined that. Okay. But we haven't seen negative fertility performances. Okay. I'm just going to ask Deirdre a question on protected urea. Um, we mentioned, or I mentioned earlier on, like that's our early win. Mm. That's, that's will get us on the road mm. to achieving our targets. Um, and ideally, we'd like to see 100% of it being used. How is it performing? And I suppose, particularly in the context of this year, we've had a drought scenario. Yep. Um, what's the, the pasture-based data saying? Yeah, so like we, we have a lot of um, research done now at four sites. Um, so uh, more Parkland, Kilty, Ballyhays and Athen Rye. And in terms of herbage production, relative to can or straight urea, no negative impact in terms of um, utilising protected urea. So like, they're, they're, once it's been used in the system, there's absolutely no negative impact on herbage production and, and people shouldn't be afraid you know, of the stories about it reducing yeah. it. It doesn't reduce it. We have, so, we have solid data to mm. show that. 
Uh, in terms of the drought, drought situation, Siobhan, no, no fertiliser is going to work in a drought. I mean, if, if the plant isn't actively growing and there isn't enough moisture there for the plant to take up the, the, the fertiliser, it doesn't matter whether it's can or whether it's protected urea, it's not going to be effective. Okay. I'll take one final question from the floor, if there is one. One here. Aidan Ahern, um, just on feeding the clover during the summer period, if we're reducing our nitrogen on the policy of, because clover requires a lot of K, how, what is the strategy of doing that? Because if we start to reduce our nitrogen, it's harder to, to get the compounds or whatever to feed K or P or whatever. So what, what do you recommend in that? Straight K, so Muriata Potash or something like that. Um, you're right, you need, clover needs a lot of K, it needs it to, for nodule formation and for nodule functioning and for the actual fixation process. So that's a really good point. We shouldn't forget about our K fertilizer. If we're, if we're putting out less chemical nitrogen or bag nitrogen and less compounds, well, we will have to consider uh, going with, with uh, straight K, uh, around a straight K around at some stage during the summer? Yeah, probably May, June time, and, and there might be a requirement for a bit in July as well. All right, thank you. Okay, I think I'm going to draw this session to a close. I'm sure everybody is getting uh, hungry at this stage. I'm not going to attempt to, to sum up what our, each of our speakers have said. I'm just going to ask each of them to give me one take-home message from this morning. Deirdre? Yeah, so my take-home mes message is to make the plant, get the clover uh, in your swords, um, and once it's there, reduce your fertilizer use. Okay, Mike? Um, I suppose I'd challenge everyone to try hit those optimal pre-grazing yields consistently across the year, and to reiterate Deirdre to get white clover into those swords as well. And Michael? Um, just, I, I would say to tap into to the enthusiasm that's there within Chagas to, to, uh, to enhance clover. Okay, thanks, Michael. And I have two calls to action on, on the back of, of this morning session. Uh, firstly, you will get this flyer, this, you got this flyer this morning on your seat when you came in. Um, Chagas have just launched a new signpost advisory program specifically to support farmers to, to help them to reduce their, their greenhouse gas emissions over the next number of years. This, this program is available to everybody, so clients and non-clients, uh, it's open to. The plan is you sign up for the program, um, we'll help you to identify your baseline, so know your number. So it's very hard to change anything unless you know the, the, the number that you're starting off with. So we'll give you details of your own, the emissions for your own farm, help you to develop a, a tailored plan for your farm and the actions that you need to take to reduce emissions. And then we'll support you through workshops and discussion groups and one-to-one -one to actually do that. That service was, was launched last Thursday and details as to how you register for, for that service or that program is available on the flyer there. So that's the first thing. Uh, we would encourage you to, to sign up. It's very hard to, to make the changes that are needed over the next couple of years without some kind of a plan to do that. And every farm is different. And we're going to need to do this on a farm by farm basis with the support of the co-ops and others that are, are, are also contributing to, to um, developing sustainability plans. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, we highlighted early on how important protected urea is in terms of achieving our targets. It's the easy win for us. So can I just remind you to order your protected urea before the end of the year? Um, I'm going to say more, no more than that. I hope you found the session useful. I just want to thank, thank our three speakers, Deirdre, Mike and Michael. They put a lot of work into preparing for today and I think if they've, they've given, um, given us very useful information going away. So just a round of applause to say thank you to them. Thank you.